Now, the first people who heard the news that Jesus was raised from the dead did not say hallelujah. In fact, they didn't say much of anything. They were too afraid. Trembling and bewilderment seized them. And those three women at the empty tomb, those first witnesses to the resurrection, they did not know what they were seeing, or actually they didn't know what they were not seeing. The angel told them that Jesus was not there. That part was obvious. The angel told them that Jesus, the Nazarene who had been crucified, was now raised, was now going ahead of them to Galilee, was now sending them to tell Peter and the disciples to meet him there. But they couldn't understand because people don't just come back. Dead is dead. And the empty tomb left a great big space in their logic, in their minds, in their thoughts, in their whole concept of the world. I was traveling the other week, and a gentleman took me out to eat, and as we sat there over our, our roast beef and french fries, he looked up and he said, I, I, have to, I had to take you out to eat because my house is a mess. He said, my wife's been gone three months. And I, I said, I'm, I'm sorry. And he said, no, it's okay, she's coming back. <laughs> and I, I honestly, I still didn't get it. I was like, what faith? This, this man has and the, the resurrection, right? She'll come back on the last day. And then he said, yeah, she, she's been watching grandkids out of state, right? But, uh, but you know, the, I was a little slow on the uptake. And these three, these three women at the, at the empty tomb, they were a little slow on the uptake, like any of us would be. They didn't get it at first, right? The, the tomb was empty, the, the grave clothes were, were folded neatly on the stone shelf inside. An angel was there telling them what happened, but their minds did not have a category for resurrection. People don't come back. Not here? Risen? What does this mean? And the angel doesn't tell them what it means, or at least not exactly, but what the angel does say is, Go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. What the angel does say is, go and meet them there. Go tell Peter, go tell the disciples, go to Galilee. And I think that last part is actually the key. Go to Galilee. Doesn't sound like much, but go to Galilee is, is a key to understanding the meaning of Jesus' resurrection. Because you see, resurrection means new life now and into the future. And it's in going to Galilee that we will discover the depth of what this means. Go to Galilee. Before Jesus was crucified, he told his disciples he, he would come back from the dead. He said that he'd go and meet them in Galilee on that night when he was betrayed. Uh, before his destiny in Jerusalem had begun to unfurl, Jesus said, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. He said, I'll see you there. See you in Galilee. Now, why Galilee? Well, it turns out that Nazareth is in Galilee, so Galilee was Jesus' home region. It was on the Sea of Galilee, otherwise known as the Lake of Gennesaret, that Jesus told Peter and James and John to cast their nets into deeper water and bring in the great catch of fish. It was the Sea of Galilee where Jesus walked on water. He called his first disciples in Galilee. He performed his first miracle in Cana of Galilee. He taught the Sermon on the Mount in Galilee. Galilee was where it all began. Galilee was the heart of Jesus' ministry. He dies outside of the walls of Jerusalem, but the majority of Jesus' ministry was in Galilee. And it's in Galilee that the angels tell the women that Jesus will meet them again. When Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome arrive at the tomb in the early hours on the third day after Jesus' death, they're expecting to perform the Jewish burial rites with Jesus. They're expecting to place spices on his body. Some of the kids said in MYM, they went to season him. Um, they, they've come to honor their teacher, to pray, to mourn. They don't know how they're going to get to the stone, that stone out of the way, the stone that Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus rolled before the entrance of the tomb. And they probably are wondering how they're going to get by the guards that the Jewish leaders had stationed there to prevent Jesus' disciples from stealing away his body. No doubt they're, they're heartbroken and heartsick and lost because this, this was not supposed to happen. 
This was Jesus. This was the prophet. This is the Messiah. This is the man who had healed others and saved others. He's the good teacher. He's the Holy One of God, and he's dead. Now what? Where do you put your faith and your hope if the Messiah gets crucified? And they, they don't know yet. I mean, they're, they're just shocked into silence by those words that they hear. I mean, the, the angels speak into them, but they're afraid. And it's also this kind of holy science, silence, this, this awe, this reverence at the divine reality that they've just encountered. I mean, what do you say? Where do you place your hope? Go to Galilee. You know, I think there's a lot wrapped up in the angel's words there. Go to Galilee. That's where you're going to meet the resurrected Jesus. And I think part of what this means is that it's Jesus is continuing his mission. Nothing in life can stop Jesus from preaching the gospel and healing and proclaiming the kingdom. Nothing in death is going to stop him either. He's going ahead of them into Galilee. And the disciples have to catch up. Keep up with them if you can because Jesus is on mission. But the other thing is that Jesus is going back into the very places where he ministered to them before. He's not going to special places or holy places. They're just places, just plain old Galilee. And so go to Galilee means go back to your regular lives and meet the resurrected Jesus there. It's go and truly live. I mean, that's where you're going to find him. You don't have to go into the temple or to the tops of the mountains or some special place. Just go back and meet Jesus in the extravagant ordinariness of life. Go to Galilee. Go to your homes. Go to your work. Go to your school. Go to your families. That's where you're going to meet the risen Jesus. That's where you'll find him. And you see the disciples doing this. Though they hang around in Jerusalem for a while, Acts tells us that they're, they're breaking bread in each other's homes and at the end of the Gospel of John, they go, they go fishing, right? Work that they used to do before Jesus called them to become his disciples. They, they dive back into their regular life. And that's where Jesus shows up. The risen Jesus comes to them on the lake shore while they're fishing. He comes to them in the upper room while they're praying. He asks for, for something to eat. The risen Jesus comes to them on the road to small town Emmaus and breaks bread with them in the inn. They, they, there are these very ordinary sorts of places where Jesus meets them. They're just living out their lives, but they're living their lives with the resurrected Jesus in and with and through them, infusing all that they are and all that they're doing with his presence. And this is good news. The message of the empty tomb is not... It's not something for, for a distant time or a distant place. It is for right here and right now. Jesus' resurrection gives us hope for the present. It's new life wherever we find ourselves. It is resurrection now. So go to Galilee. Go to your homes and your work and your school and your families. Live the resurrection now. Go to Galilee. And what this means is that we should expect Jesus resurrection life to crop up in our day-to-day -day lives. What it means is that it should change the way we live right now. The resurrection will mean that we are growing uh, as people of grace, as people of kindness and generosity. It also means that there will be hint of something more of life with Jesus that will be popping up amongst us. There will be these moments when we're just going about our daily lives and and suddenly we realize that Jesus, that Jesus just showed up. Did you catch it? Have you ever had an experience like that? I mean, a lot of times these moments when Jesus shows up, I mean, they're, they're subtle. A lot of them are very subtle. I mean, it'll be moments of trial and tribulation. It'll be the, the, these moments where we're on the cusp of loss, when we're looking over the abyss, and then just suddenly Jesus is there. He's standing right beside us. He's steadying our steps I knew someone who, whose adult son was, was, was dying. He was dying of cancer, and she was told, this, told me how she sat beside him at his bedside, and she was praying, mourning for what she knew was coming next, and she said, it was the craziest thing. There was this, this peace that washed over me. I couldn't really understand it, but it was so real. And that, that's what I'm talking about, right? The risen Jesus just shows up. 
Sometimes it's moments of awe. It's that last flutter of a, of a Kansas evening when the sun sets thick purple on the horizon and the only possible intelligent thing you can do is just hold up your hands and thank God and praise and pray. I mean, these are resurrection moments. The risen Jesus shows up. You know, think of that time that Jesus showed up for his friend um, Lazarus' funeral. He, he was late for the funeral, but he was right on time for the resurrection. And, and, and Lazarus' sister, sister Mary meets Jesus at the tomb, and she's like, Jesus, don't pull back that rock. She says, Jesus, he already stinks. He's beyond your healing power, Jesus. Just leave him alone. Just pray with us. But Jesus says, pull back the rock. Jesus says, Lazarus, come out, and he does. Lazarus comes out of sickness and decay, out of death. Take those grave clothes off of that man. He doesn't need them anymore. And that was Mary's encounter with Jesus' resurrection power. But I think we should come to expect moments like this. That the resurrection should become second nature to us, the natural, supernatural. We should expect that light will, will break into the dark places of our lives. We should expect that a path will open up. A path will open up right where we least expect it. A door will, will suddenly be cracked. We should expect that Jesus will show up and lead us one more step along his path into the good and abundant and true and living life, the, the resurrected life. There will be these go-to Galilee moments where we'll meet Jesus' resurrection in our ordinary lives. After all, Jesus is the one who said, I make all things new. And so the question really becomes, this is the question, are you woke to the resurrection? Are you alive to the resurrection? Do you see what Jesus is doing? Are you open to it? This is why Ephesians 5.14 reads, Sleeper, awake, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. What's that place in your life where God's been stirring up some hope, creating some unforeseen possibility, drawing you into something new. Where is God raising you from the dead? Those are the places where the risen Jesus is showing up. You know, sometimes you'll be the way that the risen Jesus shows up in someone else's life. I heard a gentleman tell this story the other day of how um, he, he was driving from his home in the country into church in town, and for whatever reason, he decided to go on a different route, right? Just get a change of scenery, and so he took an unpaved road, and as he's going along this unpaved road, he sees a car kind of off to the side, which he usually didn't see there, so he pulled up, rolled down his window. Everything okay? Yeah, I guess so. You doing all right there? You don't need any help? I suppose so. And he went about his business. A couple days later, he bumps into this individual who he had never seen before. He bumps into this individual in a small town grocery store. And he says, you know that day that you stopped and I was sitting on the side of the road? Yeah. I was thinking about taking my own life. But you showed up and you talked to me. And for some reason, that just gave me a sense of hope. And I didn't do it. Thank you. And he said he's never seen that guy again. Right? Sometimes you'll be the one that the risen Jesus shows up through. Sometimes you'll be the presence of the risen Jesus to someone else who needs it. Now the thing about the resurrection is that we can't control it. Author and pastor Eugene Peterson talks about how our society always wants to control the Christian message. And so instead of the, the messy, logic-breaking power of the, the resurrection. Our society wants to make Easter about a fluffy pink bunny. And we can't control Jesus' resurrection showing up in our lives, but we can meet it. We can cooperate with what Jesus is doing. We can be awoken to the resurrection. And the other thing about this is that Jesus' resurrection sends his disciples out on mission. The, their, their hearts are, are lit on fire for the work of the Lord that they teach in the temple. They teach in the, sh the streets. They, they get on ships. They go to new cities. And I love to think of Peter, right? This, this fisherman from Galilee. And he, he ends up in the great imperial city of Rome. And that, that must have been a stretch for him. But he went. 
And one of the greatest proofs of the resurrection is that the church exists at all. That the church didn't die when Jesus died. Something happened that took a hold of the disciples and shook them out of their lethargy and fear and sent them out proclaiming the good news around the world. Something happened, and that was the resurrection. They said, listen, this is good news. They said, listen, we've got to tell people about this. The resurrection changes everything. The resurrection gives us hope. This is why Peter said in his first letter that we always need to be ready to give the reason for our hope whenever someone asks us about it. It's that hope that people have continued to share throughout the generations. And it's, it's not an abstract hope. It's not an abstract future. It's hope for here. It's hope for now. Billy Graham, you know, Billy Graham just died a couple weeks ago. And Billy Graham said back in 1954, he said, I am going to preach a gospel not of despair, but of hope. Hope for the individual, for society, and for the world. That hope is the hope of Jesus' resurrection. And there, that there's more to this life than meets the eye. That there's a depth to life, a meaning to life that goes beyond keeping comfortable and putting food on the table, just going through the motions. There's this reality that is the reality of the resurrection. Jesus is real. Jesus is alive, and so we can have hope in the present. And we're called into the mission of sharing that hope. But the resurrection also gives us hope for a new life in the future. And you see this in the teaching of scriptures. It's, um, Jesus' resurrection is not a one-off event. Paul calls Jesus' resurrection the first fruit. So Jesus is the first, the one who opened up the new path of life, but he's not the only one. All who place their faith in Jesus will be raised to new life in him. And Jesus himself talked about this in the Gospel of John. He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And it's not just to believe that the resurrection happened, to believe that if there had been a video camera set outside of that stone tomb 2,000 years ago that we would have captured something amazing. It's that, but, but belief is also trust. To believe in Jesus is to place our trust in him. It's to base our life on him and then to walk from that place of trust into the life that he leads us into, into the life that is to come. You see, because of Jesus' resurrection, there is a heaven. And if you confess your sins and place your faith in Jesus, that heaven is wide open to you. And we live in a moment where many people take, don't, don't take heaven seriously, kind of snicker at heaven, right? Imagine that, well, we, we all go there because deep down we're all nice people or, or disparage it, laugh at it. Imagine that heaven is kind of a children's story, sort of a nice greeting card sort of thing that we say to prop us up when we've lost a loved one. But we need heaven. We need a real, robust vision of heaven, this place where the holy God dwells, this place that is beyond all of our imaginings. And no doubt, everything that we have in mind about heaven will pale in comparison to the real deal. We need an authentic vision of heaven, like Revelation 7, that speaks of heaven as a place where everything will be made right, where God's justice and truth prevail, where every tear is wiped away, where there's no more sickness or death. That's what gives us hope when we lose a loved one. But I think heaven is also what gives us courage to pour out our lives for something more than the immediate. Heaven gives us that eternal perspective. Think of the Apostle Paul. He said that he's able to live his life with confidence because of his hope in the resurrected Jesus. Paul said, we walk by faith, not by sight. He said, we'd rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. He said, I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. He sees his whole life influenced and inflected by this hope in joining the resurrected Christ in heaven. He's got his feet on the ground, but he's living with heaven in his sights. I think of the late Christian philosopher Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard is kind of one of my heroes, and he grew up in rural Missouri. He became one of the most influential Christian thinkers in the 20th century, and Dallas Willard dedicated his life to teaching about what it really means to live the authentic Christian life. At the end of his life, he died just a couple years ago, at the end of his life, a, a friend of his said, Dallas, 
Dallas, are you afraid? Are you afraid to die? He said, no. He said, no, I'm not afraid. He said, you know, I actually believe all the things I've been teaching all these years. And that sounds a lot like the words that I've heard from saints great and small over the years. People in the hospital who know that their time is short, people on their deathbeds. Are you afraid? No. And it's because of their hope of the new life and the resurrection. Jesus' resurrection means new life now and in the future. And it's my prayer, it's my Easter prayer that each of us would have a hearty sense of that hope, that we would be drawn into that hope, that we would live the resurrection now and long for the resurrection in the future. Friends, Jesus is alive and goes before us. He's the pioneer and perfecter of our common faith, the one who has trampled down death by death. And like those women at the empty tomb, go to Galilee is our rallying cry for the resurrection life. Go to Galilee. It's like, remember the Alamo. Go to Galilee. It's our rallying cry. Go live out Jesus' resurrection life. Go live it out in everything that you are, in everything that you do. Go with the hope of the resurrection, long with the resurrection for the future. Go to Galilee. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.